everything we did earlier to make sure my laptop didn't go to sleep didn't work. Um, so here we are. Um, morning. Uh, I'm Eleanor. Uh, most of us probably know Go as, as a language that's used, is quite established in certain industry sectors. So, you know, projects like Kubernetes, Docker, there's probably a bunch of sponsors downstairs who would advertise themselves as Go shops. Um, and I've never worked in a Go shop, so, and I think probably a lot of people haven't, but there's a certain learning curve that comes with Go in terms of um, getting started and navigating your choice of libraries. Um, so this is basically our journey through what a pack, uh, repository we've called GoNS and everything we've done to use Go during a project we've been running in the publishing team at the Office for National Statistics. So when the clicker works, there we go. Um, so just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I've been working in technology for about four years now, and I was introduced to Go fairly early on in that journey. Um, and my entire career, I've been working with government departments to help them move services into like digital age. Um, I also run the Cardiff Go Meetup, so if you're ever in South Wales, come and say hi. Um, but specifically today, I want to talk to you about the time I've spent in the Office for National Statistics using Go and sort of the lessons we've learned in that process. So a few years ago, the ONS rebuilt their website. The previous website didn't have a good reputation, and through user testing, they found out that it'd be great if we had a website people actually liked. So a project was embarked on to rebuild the website. Lots of good feedback came out of that. People are much happier with this version of the website than they were before. But there is still a problem. People would get to pages like this, which is fundamentally how users access data from the ONS. So they get to a page like this, and it's a bunch of links to download large files. So if you're looking for economic statistics, you're downloading this Excel spreadsheet and digging through it for the information that you actually care about. Because chances are you're only interested in data that relates to your area or a certain time period or your age group or whatever category you're interested in. Um, and because of so much user feedback coming in about this, ONS were really invested in finding a way to solve this problem. But fundamentally, this requires a completely different view of publishing data. It requires the publishing systems to move from understanding files to understanding the data those files contain. And this is the first time ONS have ever tried to do that. And if you look at the way ONS gather data, we're just going to have to break down some terms, because otherwise everything else I say ain't going to make any sense. Um, so in ONS, if you look at fundamentally all the data can be represented in a CSV. And if this is your CSV, it's referred to as a data set or often it would be a new version of a data set. So economic statistics are published regularly. They are a data set. Every publish of that is a new version of that data set. So within this CSV, every column, barring the first, is called a dimension. It's one of the ways this data set can be sliced up. It's one of the categories a user might be interested in. In this data set, we have dimensions of sex, age, and preferred pet. Um, Within each of those columns, you have options. So a dimension option in the sex category would be male or female. And this is, again, another way a user might want to slice this information. In the future, it's possible ONS might have a less antiquated view of things, and we would have more options for sex over time. We might have more ages in a different data set. Another data set might not have pets. It might have you know, town or economic livelihood or any other measure. But the bread and butter of a data set in ONS is always this first column. It's an observation value. An observation value can be a number. It can be an index. Sometimes the numbers don't make any sense because it looks like a count, and seven and a half people don't own no pets. That doesn't really make any sense. Um, but because of the way statistics are calculated, these numbers are often a little bit bizarre, unpredictable. Sometimes they're not numbers. Sometimes it's an X. Sometimes it's a dash. And they all mean different things, and we need to have ways of linking all of this data up. But what users are really going to want to get to is a unique observation value, or a number of unique observation values. Every unique observation is defined as a unique combination of dimension options, which basically means female 27 panda is only going to exist in that data set once. And if you know that someone is looking for female 27 panda, this is the one value you will get back. And that is true across all data sets in ONS. 
what actually is on the right-hand side of your observation, that is all subject to change across all data sets in ONS. So it's a very complicated problem in terms of how we're going to model all of this data and how we're going to build systems that can robustly digest that information. So the technical challenges we were faced with trying to figure out how to you know, disaggregate all of this data is basically we'll probably need a database somewhere, and we don't even know what that database might be. We feel like if we're going to be parsing large files and splitting them down into all of these different categories, to us it seems sensible to do that in an event-driven way so that we could scale each part of that process separately. Because in some cases, you'll have lots of dimensions. In some cases, you'll have lots of options. And like, there's not a lot of predictability about the ways you'll need to scale these systems. So being able to scale them independently led us to microservices. So all of these factors kind of came into play. And Go has a good reputation in a lot of those areas, which is why we started using Go. Um, from an engineering perspective, we talked about using Go because it's quick. It's really efficient. Trying to do things concurrently is uh, there's a lower barrier for entry for that, so that was really appealing to us. Um, like I said, microservices, and we knew there were good libraries out there for event-driven systems. We also talked about, sort of from a human perspective, why Go was good for us, and because we were a blended team, I work for a consultancy called Methods. There's an ONS permanent employee team, and we had you know, a group of 15 people across these two teams working together, but that meant halfway through, or you know, at the end of this project, half those people are going to leave, and that knowledge leaves with them. But if you build your services and if you write your code in a way that it's designed to have a low barrier for entry, that you invest time in documentation, that you don't have to have discussions on your style anymore because GoFormat does that for you, that kind of thing was really appealing to us. So even from the human side, Go seemed to meet a lot of criteria for us. So we started looking at what our systems like at a high level, what the architecture might look like. And for our import process, we basically came to this very high-level outline. Um, in our case, Florence is the internal publishing tool, the CMS. Um, we'd have some APIs that would manage metadata and manage information about the import files. But we have this core pipeline. All of these services are event-driven. They all look at the same file, and they all have some responsibility for communicating that information down to a database. So even just in these services, we can see there's quite a lot of repetition. These services in the core pipeline, they're going to communicate with similar things in similar ways. The APIs, they'll probably communicate with similar things in similar ways. So we felt it was likely we would have some you know, repetition in our code. And a little bit of work had already been done at ONS using Go. So this repository existed, GoNS. And 14 months ago, this was how many packages we had. And we were at the start of a new project. We had a lot to do and not much time to do it in. And we decided, this repo exists. We'll just add packages to it as we go. We knew we were going to be writing shared code because we have all of this repetition. And we didn't want to repeat ourselves that much. Um, and particularly when things were changing that quickly, the likelihood that we'd change it in one place and forget another, and then debugging that wasn't going to be fun. So we said, OK, we'll just, we'll just chuck them in GoNS for now. We'll tidy up later because we've all said that. And then we started looking at our, you know, our architecture again, and we went, oh, by the way, we forgot another four services that are really crucial to this pipeline. So we have even more repetition right out the bat. So we're really reaffirmed in our belief that we're going to be writing some you know, shared libraries to help us leverage um, across all of these services. So these are all of our services that use Kafka. Kafka is a publish, subscribe, event-driven mechanism. Um, we, by having our services being able to produce and consume Kafka messages, it meant, like I said earlier, that some of them could scale differently. So our extractors could send messages to the importers, and we could make decisions about whether we would batch those messages or process them individually, how many instances of those services we would run. So event-driven was really going to help us achieve a lot of things here and process data asynchronously, which was really important to us at this scale. Um, all of these services communicate with HTTP in some way. So if we were going to be putting HTTP code in there, it seemed reasonable that we, we might want to do that in a consistent way. Uh, Neo4j is the graph database we chose. And all of these services communicate with our graph database. Um, graph databases, for those who don't know, and I only found out about them 14 months ago, are basically a way of modeling data by nodes and the relationships between them. So 
where I would consider in, in traditional like SQL and NoSQL databases, um, you basically you have rows or you have documents, and then you query to build relationships between them. But the relationships themselves don't hold any data. So in, say, SQL, you might have a data set API in one place and an import tracker in one place as rows in databases, and you can join them up with a query, but that relationship doesn't have any special properties. Whereas with a graph database, that relationship can also contain data. It can also have attributes, which for us was really powerful to be able to leverage to um, build more complex querying, um, particularly in our export pipeline more than our import pipeline. Uh, but, so we were fairly confident we'd want to use a graph database, but we had a lot of learning to do. These services communicate with S3 and Bolt, so we use Amazon S3 to store our files. We publish statistics that like, make a difference to the government and impact the economy, so security is fairly important. Um, and the, uh, the statistics that ONS gather have to be published at a very specific time. So everywhere that we integrate with S3, we also integrate with HashiCorp Vault to ensure that our uh, files are encrypted. Um, so we basically just ended up writing a library that does both of those things for us. Um, Mongo is used in these three places. Again, Mongo, if you don't know, is a document store. So where we have APIs, it seemed reasonable that they would largely be pushing JSON information. And in that way, a document store that would store it in JSON seemed very efficient for us. So we've used different tools where we found they were necessary, but in every case, we have repetition. And we needed some way of managing that. So if we look firstly at Kafka, because there's just so many of them, um, we'd see that we're here we're creating lots of consumers and we're creating lots of producers. And again, this is in no way me saying, you should use our Kafka library, it's better. It is not better. We chose to use the Shopify Sarama library because it is such an industry standard for doing these kinds of things. The changes we've made and the library we've written is very much to make it work for our use case in the ways we wanted it to work with the consistency we were aiming for. Um, so it's just really important to consider all of these things within your own context. Um, and we, didn't, we certainly didn't need to, to you know, reinvent the wheel or anything. We were fairly confident that Sarama would do the things we needed it to do. We just wanted to maybe make that a little bit easier to repeat across all of our repositories. This is essentially the async producer select example in the Sarama library. It's just there. You just copy and paste it, and that's what we did. We took an example out of the library's documentation, we pasted it into our own package, and we wrapped it in our own function. Now we can call that, it's a one-liner instead of 30 lines. We did make a small change to it because of our use case. Um, we've added a closer channel that doesn't traditionally exist in the Sarama library, um, which is just to allow us to communicate across all areas of this producer through channels and in a consistent way. Um, if we quickly look at what's happening inside of this, um, we create some variables. You can see we directly call the Sarama library. It, it's not doing anything weird and wonderful. It is the Sarama example. But we've added that extra channel. In our select statement, we've added logging in the way that makes sense to us. And that way, it means that across all of these services, we have common log messages that we can search for in an aggregator. Again, this was really important to us because with this many systems, being able to know, well, in these five services, we call it like a producer. And then in these five services, we call it an async producer. And you have to know what to search for. That wasn't going to fly. So we put in logging for what was going to make sense for us. Um, and we also have the defer at the top to close the producer all around. And all of this comes from the standard example. But at the end of the day, what it served for us was consistency of error handling, consistency of log messages, and a limited Kafka blueprint in each of our services. Kafka wasn't the thing we were interested in in these services. We're building services to read data out of a file and process that information. Kafka's a mechanism for that, but we didn't need that pollution in our code bases um, when we could just as easily serve it from a shared library. Um, so we had a consistent way to create a producer. Because we've added uh, uh, the extra channel, we couldn't directly call the close function of the existing Sarama library. Fundamentally, our producer embeds the Sarama producer, so most of those functions are still available to us. Um, and it was really important to us that we didn't lose that functionality, and we satisfied the interface where possible. Um, but for close, we'd added an extra channel, and we needed to deal with that. So I mean, you can see here, it's not complicated. We close the producer. We make sure that we've closed the channels. And then we move on with our lives. Not difficult. It just was what we needed to do. Um, 
So if we think about producers and consumers as being roughly the same, they're obviously not roughly the same, they do completely different things, but in a Sarama world, they both have examples, we, both, we needed to adjust both in a very similar way, we wanted to add that extra channel, um, and so we did the very same thing with the consumer. We have a new consumer function, we have a separate close function, and that all seemed to work. But the biggest difference for us between a producer and a consumer is being able to gracefully shut that down. So when you close a producer, for us, producing happens at the end of a process. So either you have produced a message, or you're not about to try and produce a message. Because realistically, it's up to the consumer whether or not you've consumed that message. So we can kind of safely shut down the producer, not worry about whether it's about to throw an error. It either will have thrown an error or it's not going to because we control that from the consumer side. And we added this stop listening to consumer function, which basically means if our apps receive a signal that says something's gone wrong, abort, abort, die, die, the scheduler's decided this application needs to stop, then we need a way of saying, okay, hang on a minute, we're in the middle of something and we're gonna lose error messages and context if we don't handle this well. Um, stop listening to consumer allows us to close only the consumer channel and leave the error channel open, which then means while this is still processing information, errors can be reported back, we can handle those errors and then close the rest of the consumer afterwards so we're not losing errors in that way. All of this comes together in a fairly simple function where you can see at the top here, we've created a producer, we've created two different kinds of consumers, and they're fairly short. It's not you know, these 30 lines of code that we have to put into every repository. I've canceled my errors here. Please do not ignore your errors in your code. This is not an example of good practice. Um, but so after we create our um, producers and consumers, you can see we just, in the application, there is an application-specific event loop. Calls a handler, does whatever thing that application needs to do. And this is where we block and wait for signals. Um, fairly straightforward. We can now have signals come in on those error channels, which is why it's so important that that consumer channel stays open. Um, and then towards the end, we stop listening to the consumer and then finish what we're doing and then actually close the consumer when we're done with it. Um, so in our Kafka library, we wrapped a industry standard third-party library in a way that worked for us. It might not work for everyone else, but it's valuable for us to understand our use case and to make sure that the way we're handling it is going to be consistent across all of these services. So we know how our services are going to communicate through this pipeline, uh, but we don't know how our data is going to be stored yet because Neo4j is still a mystery to us. So when I said earlier on that one of the really good things about Go for us was that you know, there's a lot of you know, consistency and agreement about how that should work. It can provide a team with a really good amount of common ground, particularly when you're bringing two teams together. Neo4j was the complete opposite for us. We had never used a graph before. A lot of us didn't have a lot of familiarity with it. Um, so and we didn't know whether there were strong libraries for it in Go either. Um, so we had a lot to learn, um, and we didn't even know what that learning curve would be like. Um, but we'd done a bunch of database tests that had basically proven that SQL databases and NoSQL databases wouldn't work for what we were trying to do, that a graph was the most efficient way of doing it, and it, we were so invested in this, it was a risk we were willing to take, despite our lack of knowledge in the area. Um, just for some context, the way our graph ended up looking is that Every observation value, like I talked about before, so the number on the left-hand side of your CSV is the number on the far right of your screen. And every observation is defined by uh, relationships to a unique combination of dimension options. So there will only ever be one value that relates to female and panda. Um, so we decided that with this graph structure in mind, uh, Neo4j had a query syntax that we particularly liked. It was a little bit easier for us to get to grips with right at first than some other query languages. They're not radically different. It was just, you know, we had a lot to learn, and this one seemed to be a little bit more straightforward for us. Um, so we decided to find out whether there was a Go library for Neo4j. And on the Neo4j website, there is a link to this community-based, community-provided driver. And we had a lot of conversations about this page. Because as a team who were new to Go, not new to Go, we had a mixture of experience, and we're looking at this going, how do we know that this library is good enough for us to use? Like, what metrics are you going to use to define that you're comfortable with a library? Are you going to look at 
stars or contributors or the last updated package. But does any of that really matter? And ultimately, we decided that it didn't, that it was a risk we were willing to take. Because we were so invested in graph databases at this point, so determined that this was the right solution to our problem, that we knew we'd be willing to write our own library if it came to it. And at that point, what are you going to lose by using a community driver? Someone's done some legwork for you. So we started with this. Um, it got us off the ground. And, and it allowed us to gain more familiarity with graph databases and the kinds of queries we were going to need to do. We began to see, you know, every now and then we find a bug. And we thought, well, we've never really contributed back to a third party library yet. How do we do that? And it became quite difficult for us to find a, like, one specific answer to that problem. And that's because there is no one specific answer to that problem. For a while, we, we, we had a little bug fix, and we thought, oh, well, do we, do we update our imports to our fork until that gets approved? Or do we always point to master? Or do we always point to our fork? And if we always point to our fork of this repo and someone else um, submits a pull request and updates the master, then how are we going to maintain that? And we just went round in circles about it. And then we realized it was Thursday afternoon, and a lot of us were off on Friday, and maybe we'd just give the maintainer the weekend and see if he approved it anyway, which he did. So we didn't update our imports to begin with. Um, our changes got merged in. We re-vendored the package, and everything was fine. So we went, OK, that works. And now we've built a relationship with the maintainer. So if you're working with a third-party library and you think you're likely to be contributing back to it, establishing that relationship, and like the first pull request can be the scariest one because you have no idea how long it's going to take. But it might take a few days, and then you're fine. So building that relationship can be really valuable because it meant the next time we thought, well, there's a feature that we'd really like, actually. We could open a pull request and be fairly confident that it might be responded to within a few days. And also, at that point, with a new feature, because we weren't necessarily sure that it would get accepted into the main package, and we were keen to make sure we were using the main package where possible, we didn't update our code to use that feature on like our production branches yet. You know, So we, don't, we, didn't re we didn't change our imports at that point. We said, we'll wait, see if the new feature gets accepted. Then we'll change our code to implement that new feature. So in that case, again, we didn't change our imports. And also, at that point, we were not in a production environment. So hey, it was all right. And then the situation came where we were in a production environment, we found a bug, and it crashed all of our systems. And we thought, OK, we need to update our imports at this point. Um, because we found a solution to that problem, implemented it very quickly, rough and ready, re re changed our imports to include our cut of that code. Um, so our applications come back to life, hooray. And also, it gave us a chance to then tidy that up before we contribute it back to the community, rather than just throw in messy code out there. Um, so just consider if you can wait, if you can't wait. Like, change your imports if you need to. But I wouldn't worry about making sure you're doing the right thing in that case. The right thing is what's right for you. It, we failed to find a very thorough standard on what you should and shouldn't do in this area. And by all means, if there is one, come and tell me. Um, but just do what's right for you. In all of these library choices, you just have to do what is sensible in your use case and not worry about the ramifications that, like the implications that might have on a community. If you're contributing back, worry about what that might mean. But for you, like just do what's right for you and don't worry so much about it. And this question of would you build it yourself is a bit of like a knife edge thing, right? Would you build it yourself? Yes, I'm going to build it myself. Don't. If you would build it yourself, if you're so invested in using a technology that you're willing to write the library yourself, and the library already exists, if it suits your use case, use it. Even if it doesn't have as many stars as you think you might like. Worst case, you're going to save yourself re-implementing someone else's mistakes. Go code is so beautifully simple because you can go into that library and read the source code. And Usually, you can pick it up fairly quickly. And you can tell from probably not long of an investigation whether or not that library is going to suit your use case right now. And if it does, use it. And if you find you need a new feature, contribute back. And don't be afraid of using something that hasn't been updated in a certain amount of time. These metrics aren't what matters. What matters is getting you productive as soon as possible. And community libraries are great for that. And they're also an opportunity for you to contribute back. So later on, we added actually a Neo4j package to our own GoNS repository because it had a health check in it. 
and we health check in quite an opinionated way. We didn't think it was appropriate to contribute that back to the community library. So equally, if you're contributing back, consider, is this something that you do because of your use case, or in an opinionated way, or is it something that's likely to be relevant to other people? We've had a lot of conversations about the fact that our health check is very opinionated, but the library still lacks some sort of you know, ping or health check or anything like that. So maybe there's a middle ground there. Maybe there is something we could contribute back because we know there's a need for health checks, but we want to implement it in the library in a fairly non-opinionated way. So we've stored our data. Our data communicates through its pipeline, but we need to communicate with our APIs. And we needed HTTP for that. And obviously, net HTTP is a very established package. We did not propose to go and reinvent the wheel with net HTTP. But there were a few things that would make it more useful for our use case and that would guarantee that we were using it in a consistent way across all of these repositories. So we, invent, we invented, we, we wrote a package called our HTTP, which is robust HTTP for us. And it fundamentally was designed to solve two problems. One was to set up consistent defaults, and the other was to allow us to exponentially back off with retries. This is the entire solution to the first problem. We just set up an implementation of the client struct with the timeouts that were relevant for us. Again, in your use case, it might not be relevant to have the same timeouts everywhere. For us, it is. Our APIs, we have microservice APIs that are all served under one central API. So consistent responses between those things and a consistent feel across them is important to us. So this is how we solve that problem. Um, in the core, it's just an HTTP client. At the top, we've got a few custom fields that help us solve our other problem in a consistent way across all of our repositories. And that is the exponential backoff problem. Now, net HTTP relies really heavily on the do function. So it was important to us that we you know, continue to follow that style and that interface where possible. So we have our own do function that just wraps net HTTP do. But what it also does is call our exponential backoff function on that client. We have a little algorithm, it's about four lines long, that basically says, retry, retry quickly, retry a little bit less quickly, retry again in a bit. And it's randomized. Um, so we can still retry our requests, but we're not gonna retry them over and over and over again and hammer our own systems when something's already wrong. Um, so exponential backoff was quite important to us because we serve users as quickly as possible without damaging ourselves in the process. Um, like I say, it's a four-line function that helped us implement this. So we've got our HTTP and we're fairly happy with it, except we realized we'd completely ignored context and that's not great. Um, so in the same way that the Go core library for net HTTP changed to have, is it context HTTP? I have forgotten. We created a new library for our CHTTP, so robust contextual HTTP calls, um, to, to manage the break of interface that that would cause. Um, by this point, we were a little bit later in our project by the time we realized we'd forgotten context. Um, so we also knew more about our use case again. We knew more that every single one of our requests fundamentally, because we have secure internal systems, was gonna have some sort of authentication involved in it. Um, so we could just factor that out, put it in our do function, and it would just happen consistently. We no longer had to worry about the fact that, you know, our auth header key might have been defined as a different, like, it's not capitalized in one, and it's got a Z instead of an S in another. Like, those issues go out the window. It's all common now. Um, we also, as you can see, we just call the context HTTP do. Um, Again, it's not doing anything fancy. It just allows us consistency across all of our requests while managing the things we know we should manage as best practices, but the things we can all too easily forget if we're re-implementing that over and over again. Um, again, we still have H our exponential back off in our CHTTP, um, and it passes context where it's relevant. It's, again, not WYSI, but it does a job for us. And consider in your use case whether you know, it, managing context is probably useful for what you're doing, and if you're not doing that, consider how you might best do that across all of your repositories in a similar way, if that's relevant for you. But fundamentally, this solves quite a few problems for us. And we've been working on this project for 14 months now. We, um, Wednesday was actually my last day on this project, so right now <laughs> um, I am speaking about ONS in no way employed by ONS. Um, 
But in the last 14 months, we've added all of these packages to GoNS, which means GoNS currently contains this common code for bootstrapping our services. It integrates with our key services like Kafka and Vault, like I've talked about. And it also has a bunch of clients to integrate with each of our APIs. It also has example programs. So if you want to spin up a Kafka consumer locally to test, we've got one of those that works with our library. That's a lot of stuff to have in one repository. So really, every time we talk about this now, we start thinking we should probably be splitting this out. GoNS has served its purpose for us. You know, it got us where we needed to be. It allowed us to develop quickly. But we need to seriously consider if this is the appropriate way of managing all of these packages. And we don't necessarily feel that it is. Um, like I say, I don't work there anymore, so it's kind of not my problem. But um, my, uh, my hunch is that the best way of refactoring these, serv these packages will probably come out of looking at the things that they each import. So in all likelihood, um, the Neo4j package is going to import very different things from the Kafka package. And because of that, they can be easily isolated and removed from each other. But you know, our HTTP and our CHTTP will probably import similar things, and maybe they need to be grouped together. Maybe they don't. Maybe every single one of these packages should be its own repo. But there's some considerations to be had there. Also, there's some considerations to be had around adding unit tests to a lot of it because we were in a rush, and we maybe didn't add unit tests where we should. Um, but the biggest thing I want you to take away is that library choices, they're not black and white. It's not right and wrong. Whatever works for you is probably perfectly reasonable. And if you choose a library, and it works for you for a while, and then it stops, then just consider not reinventing the wheel. Consider learning as you go, learning from the implementation attempts others have made. And if that's not what's going to serve you, then see if there's another library that does it in a different way. Maybe that is going to serve you. Or maybe you can contribute back to them and learn in that process. Also, consider your backwards compatibility. If we had tried to change our HTTP into our CHTTP to handle context, the rewrite we would have had to do across all of our services at like the drop of a hat, if we hadn't vendored them correctly, would have been monumental. So consider when you're wrapping packages, when you're wrapping, wrapping libraries, and when you're using libraries, you know, keeping your interfaces as similar as possible because it allows you uh, easier transition in a lot of these things. Um, bonus round. Um, when I mentioned we didn't have a lot of unit tests, we didn't have unit tests in our logging package. Well, we did, but not the right ones. Um, so if you want to know why you really shouldn't reinvent the wheel with things like logging, uh, come and find me, and I'll tell you a little story. Um, if you have any questions, I'm available on Twitter. Or again, just come and find me. I'm happy to have a chat about any of the stuff we've been doing. Um, and thank you very much. <laughs>